name came from, from Real Life Church. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, a man of commitment. Mm. And uh, there's kind of two meanings to a man of commitment. Wait, not yet. <laughs> um, there's two meanings to a man of commitment, uh, which hopefully by the end we'll get that. And one is a man of commitment. Are you a man of commitment? Are you a man who makes commitments? Are you a man who who is driven by the commitments that they've made? And also, a man of commitment points to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus, uh, like I said last week when I was introducing this, Jesus isn't who he is, or didn't, become, didn't accomplish the things that he accomplished by making commitments, but he did it by keeping commitments. He wasn't, he's not defined by the commitments that he made, he's defined by the commitments that he kept. Because there's even a comparison in the Bible about Adam, who Adam failed at being the, the, the you know, the father of, of Christianity, the one who, who, you know, who God was able to, to bring the, the, his lineage through. Adam failed at that. And so there was a possibility of failure, but Jesus didn't fail. Jesus right. accomplished what he came to accomplish. And so commitment is something that is ingrained in the character of God. It is ingrained in the character of Christ. And if we are men of God, then it should be ingrained in us. Be men of commitment. I'm going to talk about those two things. I mean, about, about, about um, commitment. But first I want to just touch on a couple of things about um, the, the real man, uh, real, being real men. Because I think it's easy to get into uh, all this kind of testosterone-filled thoughts and feelings, you know, tough men, you know, this, it's, yeah, that, that kind of stuff. And that's good, you know, nothing against that. But I, I wanted to start this ministry with a, with a definition, with a, with a foundation of what we're about. And so a real man is a man who has come to the realization that he has been created in the very image of God. Amen. And that's as it's defined Amen. by this ministry. Amen. A real man is a man who has come to the realization that he has been created in the image of God. And so my prayer is that we've either come to that realization or that we're coming to that realization. That we are made in the very image of God. Therefore, since we're, we, since we've come to that realization that we're in the image of God, a real man is at his best when the nature, the character, and the qualities of God are demonstrated in and through his life. Because we're made in the image of God, we are at our best. We are we are fulfilling our purpose. We are functioning as we should be functioning when the nature, the character, and the qualities of God are demonstrated in our lives and through our lives. Yeah. Amen. So that's the definition of what it means to be a real man as is defined by this ministry. And I've gave some scripture references um, that we can reference for that. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about, I guess kind of as an intro, still dealing with the title Real Men. About, um, about that, about being in the image of God, and how that defines us as men. Um, so if you have your Bibles, if not, it's, it's, it'll be up here. Um, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Genesis 1, 27. And so I want to bring this up just to kind of um, maybe dispel some other thoughts of what it means to be a real man, because I, I think that, you know, there's, I think society has got its definition. Of, of what a real man is. The world has a definition of what a real man is. Um, and a lot of times, and, and I think even in the church, we might think that, okay, well, there is, we have men and the, and the qualities that make men, and then we have women and the qualities that make women, and we consider them like opposites. And, and so because of that, we consider, well, man has his qualities, which are, you know, he's strong, you know, he's, he's forceful, you know, he's, He's, uh, he's logical. He's a provider. I mean, there's certain things that we consider. When we think about men, we think about these qualities. And then when we think about women, we think about other qualities. Not that they're negative, but they're just different. They're caring. They're sensitive. They're emotional. They're, they're loving. They're, they're into beautiful things. And so because there's an idea that a man is a strong, forceful guy, and a woman is a sensitive, emotional, caring person, 
that to be a real man, we need to be the opposite of the qualities that make a woman. We think that to be caring, to be sensitive, to be loving is unmanly. And so, so, so we define manhood or, or real men by being ungirly. Or, you know, but, but that's why we're defining it as not being ungirly, but we're be, defining being a real man as being godly. Uh, the Bible says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Now, my question to you is, did God create women in his image? Is woman made in the image of God or not? Oh, yeah. Or is it just men? Are we in God's image? I've actually had this discussion with people, and they're like, no, no, men are in the image of, of God, and women are in the image of men. Right? But, but, there, but it's man, God, and then the woman. And so, so, the, so I want to see that, you know, it, so in other words, so like those qualities that we consider feminine, caring, sensitive, into beautiful things, does God have those qualities? Is God defined by those things as well? And so I just put um, half of the scripture up there. Um, the rest of it, it says, God created man in his image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so that's the answer to the question, because when God first made man, he made one person. And in that person was God's image. Every quality that that man, that, that God had, was put on that man. And then, out of the man, was pulled the woman. Um, the Bible also says that God... I know it's like some people are already like just turned off just by seeing the periodic <laughs> table. Because um, this is dealing with chemistry and science. But periodic table is, you know, basically what, what things are made up of. You know, it, it's like if you break things down into their simplest forms, into the atomic level, the little atoms, you know, it, you know, they're usually going to fall within the periodic table. The reason I'm showing it is because God made man. God, so the Bible speaks about how God created things and how he spoke things into existence and how he spoke the, the earth and, and the animals and the trees and, and the sun and the moon and he spoke all these things into existence but when he talks about man when he made man he created man he formed him he made man out of the dust of the ground he made him out of the earth and so we find if you were to like to break down our, us into cells and into atoms you're going to find the same Things that make us up physically are the same things that you're going to find on the earth, in nature. You're going to find because God made us men out of nature. And so because he made us out of that, the, the things that make us up, the cells that we have, the atoms that we have, they're found in nature. right? So in the same way, God pulled woman out of man. And so all the qualities that a woman has that make her a woman... They were from the man. All right? And so now, when man wants to be at his, you know, in the image of God, he is, you know, a lot of times given a wife, given a woman, to complete him and to make him in the image of God. And so to be a man isn't to deny the, those womanly qualities, but it's to understand that, you know what, we need to understand and, and, and embrace those things. So you know, and that's easier for some than others. Some aren't, you know, they just don't don't, uh, you know, it's it's a, more of a challenge to be sensitive, more of a challenge to be emotional. But I'm gonna tell you, if you know, if if that's you and God's giving you a wife, you need to put value to those things when you're making decisions as a man of your house, when you're making decisions as as the man that God has called you to be. You need to listen. To those qualities, because those are qualities that bring us closer to the character of God. Because God is not just, all man, you know, just manly qualities, but God's got both qualities. And so, back to the definition that we said before: when we realize that we're made in the image of God, and that when we are at our best, the nature of God, you know, is demonstrated through us. The character of God is, is demonstrated through us, and the qualities of God are demonstrated through us. It includes those qualities that make women. Women. Does that make sense? I, mean, I don't want to get too weird with that. But I just want to be clear that we're not here to say, 
yeah, we're men and, you know, we're, we're tough and we're this and we're that. And because of that, that defines us and that's why we're going to keep women out and we're going to, you know, that's not what we're about. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being, you know, proud to be a man and not a woman. But I'm just saying that what we're after is the character of God and, w- and what, um, what defines yeah. that. And so, um, so that's kind of like the intro to the ministry. You know, and as we move forward and we have other events, um, I want that to be something that we, we keep in mind. Um, amen. But today, I'm going to talk about commitment. Excuse me. Um, oh, I can burp in your right because we're all men. <laughs> Burping is part of being a man. It's ungodly or is it? Yeah, that's the man, so. All right. Uh, so we're gonna <laughs> I don't think it's any in the Ten Commandments. That's not how it all right, in James chapter 5, verse 12, it says, But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. And so God is calling us to, let, you know, to, to not make promises, not, not to say, okay, now this time I really, really mean it. Okay, you know, I, I pinky promise. You know, I, you know, I, I swear on my mother's grave. You know, still alive, but you know, someday. You know, God says we don't need to do that. We don't need to swear or promise or pinky or any of that. If we say we're going to do something, it should that our word should stand on its own. Uh, recently, I was listening to the radio, um, and it was one of those um, fundraisers, the telethon type of, you know, radio. You know, they were raising funds for the ministry. And, um, and they were describing how uh, fundraising has changed, or like telethons where, they, where you pledge um, to give a certain amount, how it's changed over the years. That um, previously, year, years back, um, they would get a lot of calls, and they would get a lot of people that would pledge you know, what they were going to give. Um, and then a lot of times, people wouldn't give what they said they were going to give. And that... Um, I mean, it wasn't like a lot of people that wouldn't, but, but people wouldn't. And that now, it's, it's different. And, and they weren't saying that it was like a bad thing or a good thing. They were just describing that now, they don't get a lot of pledges. They don't get a lot of people promising to give a certain amount. But then later on, they'll end up giving anyway. So usually, the, whatever is pledged, it'll be a lot less than what it used to be. But then in the end, it kind of almost balances out that people still give. And so I thought that was interesting. They weren't complaining or saying that this was a good thing or a bad thing. They were just observing that now they used to be able to make plans and, and kind of uh, you know, know where they're at. And now it's a little bit harder because they don't know exactly who's going to give what because nobody's pledging. And so and they said the reason why is because people don't – people like to keep their options open. They don't want to make a promise that they may, might not be able to keep. And so anyway, it was just a, you know, he was just commenting. The guy wasn't making a point out of that at all. He was talking about other stuff. But he said that, and that stuck in my mind. You know, it, it stuck in me, and like I said, he wasn't saying it as a negative thing, but it kind of bothered me. And I started to think about that, about how, how we live in, in a society where people like to keep their options open. You know, people like to, you know, just in case. You know, that, you know yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be there, you know, if everything goes well. But, but, but we're very – because we keep our options open, it's real easy for some – to find a reason to not do the things that we've, that we've said we we're going to do, that we've said we may do. We, we've become people who are not committed, people who are like, yeah, you know, I, I'll, I'll be there. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be there for sure. And then, oh, you know what? You know, I had to work. You know, work is important. Okay, well, you had to work. That, that's, that's excusable. You had to work. But you know what? My mom got sick. Oh, okay, well, you have, that's a good reason. And, and because we can justify not keeping our word, we're okay with that. It's not like, you know, we make a, we make a promise, or, or, or and like I said, and it doesn't have to be like, I promise. I think just we, we give our word, and then if we're not able to complete the, uh, to accomplish what we've given, you know, what we've said we're going to do, we're okay with it if we can justify it. If we can give a good enough reason for it, we're okay with not keeping our word. And the problem with that is that the value of our word, the value of your word, can only be determined by you. 
you alone determine how valuable your word is. I mean, do you have a, a, a children or a wife or friends or, or family who, who, you know, if you say you're going to be there, they're like, you know, let's hope, let's hope, he, let's hope he doesn't have to work, but let's hope he, you know, because they're not sure what's going to end up happening. And, and I'm not saying that, 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 those are, that there's never a reason to not keep your word. I'm just saying, you know what, if you, if you give your word, and for whatever reason, even if you have good excuses, but you can't keep your word, that should bother you. It, it should bother you that you were not able to keep your word. Amen. It, it should, you, you, should have, you should recognize, you know what, I am so sorry. You know, I, I gave you my word. I said I was going to do something, and I didn't do it. You know, yes, I had to work, whatever. But you know what? That, that, was, that was disrespectful to you. That was, that, that was devaluing myself and my own word. And what I say. But we co- we've become people like that. We've become people that, you know, we keep our options open, you know, just in case. And, you know, if there's a good enough reason, then I won't. And the problem with that, one of the problems with that, is that now we become open to distraction. We become open to things, you know, like, you know, we got, we got our goals. We got the things that we want to accomplish in our life. And then, but because we, we have become comfortable with justifying our excuses, justifying why we don't accomplish our word, it's so easy for us to, to get distracted, to get off of the course. You know, one, one day we're going we're gonna to be before the Lord. You know, and, and, you know, and, and if all of us having, having Christ in our hearts, you know, we'll, we'll be standing for him, before Him in judgment, you know, not about whether we're going to heaven or hell, but just about the things that we've done in our lives. And, and so God will say, you know, what did you do, you know, with, with these things that I gave you in your heart to do? What did you do with, the, you know, you, maybe, you remember when you wanted to, to uh, be a, a worship leader? Remember when, you know, the, when you wanted to go to these places? Remember all these things? You know, what did you do with that? Well, you know, um, I, I, didn't have, I didn't have time. I didn't have time. And then while you're saying before God how you didn't have time to do those things, you know, there's going to be a big old screen behind you, you know, with you watching a three-hour football game, you know. With the remote control, you know, and then the game's over, and then another game. You know, I didn't have time. Or you're gonna say, I didn't have enough money. I didn't have enough money to do the things that you called me to do. And then this big old receipt's gonna come out, you know, of all the all the the hunting equipment and fishing equipment and video games and and all the the stuff that we bought, you know, for for entertainment. But I didn't have enough money. I didn't have enough money. And all the stuff you know, you know, before us, you know. We're gonna have any excuse before God, but I didn't have anybody to. I didn't have anybody to support me. And then all the friends that we, we thought were too boring, all the people that came into our lives that kind of held us accountable and that maybe made us, you know, think about spiritual things more, encouraged us more. But they just weren't as fun. They weren't as funny, you know, as a guy who liked to, you know, drink and have a good time. And and so we kind of denied those friends. And all, you know, our class picture is gonna come out. And you know, all the people that. We kind of like shunned because they weren't fun, and, and, and we're oh, but you know, nobody there was nobody there to encourage me. When we're standing before God, there's no excuses. You know, even Adam, you know, tried to say, you know, it was the woman that you gave me, mm-hmm. and God, okay, well, because it was the woman who ate the, the fruit, well, then you know, then you're okay. You know, God didn't say that. God held the man accountable for his actions, and we need to be men who hold ourselves accountable. I don't mean that we be that you know that we need to be um, real hard on ourselves and be feeling guilty all the time. I'm just talking about putting value back into the things that we say. Amen. And nobody can do that for you. You know, we want to say we we want to get home and say you know bring me my my slippers and you know bring me the newspaper. We want we want people to do what we say. We want our word to mean something. But the only one who can put value to your words is you. You're the only one who can put value to your words. So that when you when you say something, it means something. But when there's excuses, when there's distractions, when there's reasons why we don't have to accomplish our word, then we devalue ourselves. And that is starting to get away from the character of God. Because God is a God of promises. I mean, even when Adam slipped, when he fell, yeah, he fell, he didn't slip, he fell. Even when, when Adam fell from God's graces and, and, and from, from you know, walking in God's will, 
God made a way. God told them, you know, that there, there's going to come a, uh, he called it the seed of the woman. There's going to come a seed of the woman who's going to crush the, the head of, of the, the seed of the serpent. And, and, and he was making a promise that there was going to come a, there was going to come somebody at, at a time who was going to to make up for the fall of man and for the distance that, that was between God and man. Somebody was going to come, and then throughout the Old Testament, you know, hundreds of years going by of sacrifices and all these different things that are all pointing towards the same thing. Someday somebody will come, and they're going to take all of the the wrong that you've done, all of the sin, all of the mistakes. They're going to take them on themselves. And they're going to pay the price for you. Hallelujah. For all the mistakes that you've ever made, all the mistakes that you make now, all the mistakes that you'll ever make, they're going to be on that, on him. And people would make sacrifices. They would get lambs as a symbol of what was going to come one day because that's how much they believed in that. That's how much they trusted that what God said he was going to do, he was going to do. Amen. So they would do, I mean, it was a bloody mess. It was a, a big old deal. It wasn't just like, okay, well, good, you know. Lord, I'm, it wasn't just a quick prayer. I mean, they were they would you know make the temples and do all this stuff. All of it was pointing to the same thing: that one day one would come who would take the sin of the world, and 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 because of that we could live righteously because of all of our sin was going to come upon him. Now, what if it never happened? What if God said, "Well, you know what?" I had to, you know, there was a storm. I had to go and save these people over there. You know, I, I did, you know, didn't have a lot of time because everybody's praying all these things. And what if God had had reasons? But you know what? You weren't good enough, <laughs> you know, to deserve it. So I withheld it. Because, I mean, were we good enough? The Bible says that he loved us when we were still sinners. When we didn't even recognize God in our lives. He, he he fulfilled, you know, he fulfilled his promise. He fulfilled salvation for us when we didn't even deserve it. Why? Why did he fulfill his promise? Why did God fulfill his promise? Because you deserved it? Because it was the right time for it? God fulfilled his promise because he made it. Because he made the promise. He fulfilled it. That was enough reason because he made it. Because he said, I'm going to do it. And that's all the reason that he needed. And praise God for that. Praise God that we have a God like that. That we have a God that we can trust. That he, that he is faithful. But now we're men. We're real men. Now we recognize that we are made in the image of God. And we've accepted God in our hearts and in our lives. And so now, because God is in us, now we can live the character, the qualities, the the, what was it, the nature of God <coughs> through our lives. Because now He's in us. And the nature of God is to be a God of commitment. It's to be a, a God who says, I'm going to do this. And then He does it simply because He said He was going to. Amen. Amen. Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 5.
to excuse ourselves from, you know, like I said, we, we, if, if we can come, if, if, we, if there's enough reason why we, we're not able to accomplish what, what we accomplish or, or what we said we're going to do, um, it's, it, it becomes real easy to excuse ourselves because a lot of times we look to, you know, when we judge ourselves, you know, and our own actions, we look at our intentions and what we mean to do. Uh, but, you know, but we all know that when we look at other people, you know, we don't judge them by their intentions. We judge them by what they do, what they actually accomplish. And, you know, and, and you can think of, of, you know, like when you're driving down the road, you're, you're driving somewhere and, and somebody cuts you off. And you're like, man, crazy guy, you know, they, they just cut me off. Or, you know, or, or they're speeding, you know, super fast, like crazy. Or, you know, look at this psycho and, and whatever. But then, you know, we're late. You know, we're late and we need to be there. Oh, my goodness, I got to go. And, and then we're cutting people out. But I believe in safety. But you know what? Because, you know, my circumstances, I drive like a maniac. But, because, but it's justified because my intentions are good. I have good intentions. But, you know, but others, we judge them by their actions. But ourselves, by our intentions. When we stand before God, you know, the Bible says that, that the, 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 our actions that, that um, what, what the Bible calls are stubble, hay are going to be burned away. I think the first thing that's going to be burned away is our intentions. The intentions are going to be burned away. And it's like, okay, what did you do? I always meant to do that. I always meant, I always wanted to. I wanted to be that kind of a man. I wanted to be that kind of a person. But, you know, but the intentions, they, they, they don't make us who we are. It's our actions. It's whether those intentions bear fruit. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 Verse 17 says, you may be asking why I changed my plan. This is uh, Paul talking to the Corinthians saying that they might be asking him why he changed his plan. Do you think that I make my plans carelessly? Do you think that I am like people of the world who say yes when they really mean no? As surely as God is faithful, my word to you does not waver between yes and no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Timothy, and I preached to you. And as God, and as God's ultimate yes, He always does what He says. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ, with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for His glory. And so God is glorified when we demonstrate the characters of Christ. When we're able to say yes, and then we're going to do that. When we're, I mean, we, who was it? I was talking to somebody, and they were, oh, I'm trying to, Billy, Billy's not here. And we were talking about how, um, he was saying, I was telling him about a conversation I had with one of the technicians that I work with, uh, not that I work with, but from another store. And that we were, our conversation went to the things of God. He was telling me how he prays before he goes to work. And how we had a really good talk. Um, because I, he brought up God, and so I was able to, to, to talk about the things of God, that it was a blessing. And he's like, oh, brother, you're, you're, you're lucky that you get to talk about the things of God um, at your job. And, and I didn't have a chance to really get into the conversation with him, but um, I don't get to talk about God at my job all the time. Um, there's opportunities uh, when I get asked a certain question or something, but, but it's not something that I'm able to do every day. Um, but I'm able to demonstrate Godly qualities, and and, and to, um, I'm able to, to to tell people about God by my actions, yeah. by the way that I work, and and, and I try to do that. Uh, you know, praise God. There's one of my co coworkers here, so <laughs> you know he, he can he can tell you afterwards if I'm lying. <laughs> but but I, but I try to I try to work in a way that honors God. You know, I, I know that there's things that that um. Things would go better for me at work if I did certain things or said certain things. I know there's certain standards that people hold that um, might get me a little bit further um, in my career. But my my uh, my desire is to honor God, and I kind of like hesitate to say that because I, I've actually done been I've had some pretty good success despite 
you know, going against the grain in certain areas. One of the things that I was told from the beginning when I, was, when I started working was how important it was to pursue money and to pursue, you know, that, you know, that my, my manager was, was uh, you know, just wanting to teach me, <laughs> you know, the importance of, of putting money as an important thing to, to pursue. And um, I just, you know, never, never really got to uh, preach to him or anything, but I just kind of held my, my, um, my ground that you know there were things that were more important than money. Um, and and he, he's he's a a guy who's into you know being successful and moving forward and all that stuff. And and I, and I praise God for for the way God has shown Himself um, through me over the years. Um, when I, like right now I'm a technician, right? I, I fix phones, or, or now I, I supervise over other people who fix phones. But when I first got into this job, um, actually I, I didn't start off um, fixing phones. I started uh, selling phone accessories and, and phone services. And, um, and I remember I went and I promised my, uh, the manager of that store that I was gonna, that I was gonna do my best and sell real good and, and you know, I was gonna make the quotas and all that stuff. And, and it became apparent right away that, that mm. just selling was not my strength. And I would like talk to people and talk to people, and and they would like get excited about the product, and then they would they would say, yeah, you know, I, I'm gonna come back later and buy it. For some reason, always, you know, it, 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 like or or they would like want, you know, come in and ask questions, and I would like talk to them, and and, and somehow they would. I mean, it was always good experiences with people. We always had good, but for some reason, talking to me always made them like not want to spend any money. <laughs> I don't know why, but it was like that. And I remember. Um, so I would go to work, and, and I had these quotas that I needed to, to keep, and, and um, every day there was quotas, and every day I would, I would miss them, every day. I would probably sell uh, in a month what the, just a regular salesperson would sell in one week. I mean, it was just like really bad, and then every week they would, they would give a report of where everybody was at, and I was always like way, way at the bottom. And... This job was, it, it was the kind of job that I, I just hated to go. I mean, I, I just hate, I, I would like, but in the beginning I would like get myself excited, get myself pumped up, and I would pray before I go, and I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna sell, I'm gonna you know, do what's expected of me, I'm gonna you know, fulfill my commitment to my job, and then I would, and at the end of the day, you know, I'd go home feeling like a big fat zero, you know, with nothing to show for, for my day, you know, as far as what, what they were looking for. Um, and so after a while, you know, it, it was it was just really depressing. You know, I, I was like just going through a lot of a lot of. Uh, it was just really hard to go to work. And I remember I would pray in the morning. I was like, Lord, you need to open up some other doors. You need to give me another opportunity because this is not working out. As hard as I try, I cannot be successful here. And I would pray and I would cry out to God. I mean, I was just I hated going to work. And I would always hear God clearly with the same thing. I mean, I wouldn't hear his voice, but I would like get the same thing in my heart. Just go. Just show up. I'd be like, oh man, it's the last thing I want to hear. And so I would go. And then um, a month went by, um, and I was like way, way below quote. And they said, okay, we're gonna, you know, the first month, you know, it's okay, you, you know, uh, you'd get written up if you didn't get meet your quotas. So they would write me up, but they would be like, it's okay, you know, we're going we're gonna to get better. And so the second month, you know, they, they, were train, they were training me more, and the manager would actually stand next to me to listen to everything that I'm saying, to make sure I was saying, and they would say, I would say everything right. I'd say everything that I'm supposed to be saying. But then the person in front of me just didn't want to buy anything. And, you know, and so second month went by, another write-up, and then the third month they were telling me that you know, that that was it. Three write-ups and you're fired. And uh, so I was trying. I, was, I got a little bit better. Um, you know, my my months were like a, uh, 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 like a week and a half of a regular salesperson. Um, and it was the same thing every day. I would pray and I would ask God to, you know, give me, give me permission to quit. <laughs> you know, give me another opportunity. And, uh, and it was always the same thing. Just, just show up. And then, so after three months, it was already going to be time for me to uh, to get my third write-up, which is grounds for termination. 
and um, and I went to go talk to the manager before he came to me. I was like, you know, I know I'm try I'm trying really hard. You know, um, I, I know I know I can turn it around. I understand if you need to let me go because of this, but you know, um, it's not that I'm not trying. It's not that I don't want to. And then that's when um, I found out that there was a position open as a as a technician, you know, fixing phones. Uh, because one of the technicians was moving, or he, he lived in, in Edinburgh, and so he would drive all the way. Because the technician um, in, the, in the cell phone industry, that's like a really nice job. People don't leave that job. Usually people that are there, they're there for years. Uh, because it doesn't have the same um, demands and the same stresses that, um, that it does for the salespeople. And so anyway, so they, I asked if I could apply, and they said, yeah, that I could apply, but that the job was already promised to somebody else. So I found out, I applied for the job, I found out that there was a guy that had been hired a year before, and he was an older, he was older than I was, and he had a lot of experience uh, fixing all kinds of electronics equipment. He used to fix walkie-talkies and uh, radios, and, and he worked in different places uh, doing that, and that's what he did. But he had gone to that store, and he had, he had uh, applied, and they told him that they were going to hire him as a technician. But at the moment, there wasn't any positions, but that in the meantime, he could sell. And he, he was a real good salesman. And so the job was already his. He had already been there for a year waiting for this position to open up. It finally opened up. And then so I was like, you know, just can I at least apply? Can I at least try? And they're like, okay, go ahead. And so I applied. Um, the, the, the technicians that were already there, they liked me a lot. And so they said, you know, they put in a good word for me and stuff, but that, you know, and then, um, and then they also let me know. They said, "Look, if we'll let you apply for the job, but even if you do get it, we want you to know that you're going to get. It's going to be a decrease in pay. Technicians get paid less than. That was. It was called customer service, but it was all about sales. And then, so I said, okay. Um, there was a little bit of hope, but um, I was just like waiting for God to do something to open up a door. And then uh, finally, it came time. For, you know, the end of the three months, and it was already. You know, I got my last write up." was already time for me to be terminated from that job. And then they told me, um, you know what, we went through the, we went, we looked at the resume and the application and everything, and we're going to go ahead and hire you for the technician job. And, you know, I was like, you know, how, how, why, how, <laughs> you know, how did that happen? They said, well, let me be honest with you. This is the other guy, um, sometimes he calls in, uh, sometimes he's late. Um, Technicians need to be dependable. We need to know they're going to be here. The, the whole three months that you've been here, you've never been late. You've been here every day. You always show up. And because of that, we're going to give you the position. This is the one thing, and, I, and I'm telling you, that's what God would tell me. Just show up. Just show up. And I hated it, but I would just show up. And because of that, because I was obedient to God in that area, I mean, people are going to tell you, you know, you need to, you know, you, you need to, how's a good way of saying it? You need to um, be really nice to your superiors, you know, to get in good graces with them, you know, uh, you know, kiss their butts. You know, you need, you need to, you need to do this, and, you, and they'll give you all kinds of things. But I'm telling you, when 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 your character shines through, when you do the things that that God calls you to do, and they see your people notice, and even if they don't don't they, if they don't, God will still make a way. Amen. I got that position because I showed up every day. And when they went and they wrote, just because God wanted to show me that it was him, when they presented me the paper that I needed to sign, accepting the new position, um, and they had my pay on there, and he's like, oh, usually there's a decrease, but they gave you a dollar raise for some reason. But can you sign here? <laughs> and so I signed, and I got, a, I got an increase in pay. And I went into that position, grateful to the Lord, and I served the Lord in that position, and I just advanced there. I just advanced quickly and got raises and, and promotions. And, um, and then, um, like, I left the industry to go into ministry. And that's a whole other story. <laughs> but then going back into it, it, it's been where I've already learned my lesson. That serve God where I work. Even though I'm not able to preach there. I'm not Pastor Robert or I'm not Brother Robert at work. You know, I'm just another technician. But I try to live by godly principles. So most of you know that in December I was approached by the owners of the company and they sat with me, they talked to me for a while and I just told them honestly how I work and why I do things and I told them 
I do things for God because God's the one who promotes me. If my job is gone for whatever happens, I know that God, he's still there. So that's why what I do, I do it to God. And I told, I just, you know, was, was real, real uh, forward about that. And so, so they gave me a promotion. They gave me the promotion um, that most of you know that I've gotten. And afterwards, they told me, well, different to those, a few guys that, I, that were speaking to me, the owners, one of them told me that it was my faith that really impressed them. And another one told me that it was my honesty because I was telling them about some of my weaknesses and areas that I struggled. Um, and it was those qualities that they saw that caused them to put me in the position that, that, that I have. But I know it's the Lord. I know it's the Lord. I don't um, boast about where I'm at or I don't get comfortable in, in my position. You know, jobs come and they go. But I know that as long as I do things to, to please the Lord, and that's my focus, that there's always promotion. There's always no. moving forward because the Lord's the one who's in charge. And, and so, you know, I've been counseled to pursue money. I've been counseled to, you know, work my way up the corporate ladder. I've been counseled to do all these things. The only thing that's, that's done me any good is when I do things unto the Lord. And He brings promotion. And He brings advancement. He brings all those things. And I don't even have to ask for them. And again, I'm not saying it to, to boast of myself. I'm just saying, you know what, these things that I'm saying about, about being a man of commitment, being a man of integrity, they're not just things that I've read in the Bible and that I think they might work. They're things that I hang on to and that I try to live by. And I know that we all do. And, and this isn't a me teaching you how to live time. This is just a reminder. You know, if we end up getting like bumper stickers or t-shirts or caps or whatever that say real men, I hope that we all see them the same way, that we don't think, okay, I'm a real man. This means I'm a real man. We don't see it as a description of who we are, but that we see it as a reminder of what we're to strive to be. Because that's all this is. It's, it's a time of reminding each other. You know what? We need to remember, you know, being a person of commitment, keeping your word, doing what we need. It's a time of, 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 of uh, it's a reminder. Um, I'm going to close with this scripture, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Hebrews 12, starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, it says, let us lay aside every weight. And by weight, it's talking about those things that keep us from fulfilling what we need to fulfill. And in this case, I'm talking about keeping our word. The things that are keeping us, the excuses that we have, the reasons that we see, you know, I couldn't do it because of this, because of the pain. Let's lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, <coughs> looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. All right? So He's our example in us running this race, in us meeting the goal, doing the things that we're, we're called to do. And He's the example. He says, Who, speaking of Jesus, for the joy that was set before Him, endured the cross. You know, he he had... See, that's the thing. There, there's a goal. There's something that we're trying to reach. And because our eyes are fixed on that goal, the distractions, the hardships, the excuses, they don't... They, they, they have no effect when our eyes are on the goal. When we're trying to accomplish that thing. The distractions have no effect. And that's how Jesus was. Jesus endured the cross. But he didn't just endure the cross because he had to. He endured the cross because he was seeing the goal. He was seeing the joy that was going to be set before him. And so it says, um, what was I? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and, and, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those of, uh, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and so Jesus him being glorified it glorifies God and just like that just like you know Jesus him being glorified and everybody praising him it glorifies God the Father when we are successful when we do that, even when people look you know look to us and say hey you know they're doing pretty good you know when people not praise us in, in, in that sense but but you know say this person's doing pretty good when we look good to others that pleases God it pleases God to see us be successful. It pleases God to see us, you know, not just be successful. I mean, I spoke about work today, but I mean in our homes, you know, with our families, you know, with our, with, with our friends. It pleases God to see us be successful. God doesn't call us to be men of commitment. What was that? Oh, I see. That was like a smoke alarm. Fire, let's go. <laughs> It pleases God. And that's why He calls us to be men of community. This isn't a, a weight to be put on. Oh man, we're men and now we have to do what we say. <laughs> you know, now we have to accomplish our... It's not a, a, uh, a chore or responsibility that you now have to fulfill. It is a blessing that we have. That we can be men of commitment. That Jesus gave us the example. And through Him, we're able to, to do that and have the, the, the family that He wants us to have. Be that, that husband, or that father, or that son, or that friend. To be those things that he, that he wants us to be. Because God is glorified when we are successful in these areas. And so we don't have to be afraid of, of, um, of the, 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 the struggles that will come with it. And here's the thing. I'm asking and, I, and I'm reminding us to be men of commitment. To be men who, who value our words. And if we receive it. If we walk out of here and say, you know, yes, you know, I, I do receive that. I know that, that Christ is in me and that he, is, is a, as a, he was a man and is a God of commitment. And I will be those things. When we decide that, then trials come. Then the reasons come. The things that will keep us from being a man of commitment, they'll start to, to rise up. And so we'll, I mean, here in times like this, now it's easy to say, yes, I'm going to be a man of commitment. Yes, I'm going to be a man of my word. And then we walk out. And then that's where, you know, like you say, the rubber meets the road. That's when we need to be ready to, to, to press on. And you know what? The only way we're going to do it is with God's help. God is the one who will get us through that. Um, so before, before we leave, we're going to pray. And we're not going to pray just to religiously close the service. We're going to ask God, you know, to, 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 to come and, and to walk with us daily. And to help us be men of commitment. Not because of, of what it does for us, but because of what it does for God. It glorifies Him. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you.